How are you all? Thanks all for that introduction. Um, hi, how are you all? Good. <laughs> so suppose I'm going to have to begin by asking for an apology. So soon after a World Cup and all the media saturation that comes with that, I, I'm going to actually start my paper with a football-related analogy. My World Cup hangover, you see, has kind of just kicked in and I haven't spent a summer with my thoughts fixated on a combination of politics and football. I'm still finding it very difficult to separate the two. My analogy, you see, it relates to one of our own World Cup heroes of Italian 90, Mr. Dave O'Leary, the man who took a penalty while a nation held its breath. But it's, it's not that penalty I'm going to focus on, unfortunately, but rather another incident regarding Mr. O'Leary, who in 2005-2006 was the manager of an underperforming Aston Villa team, some of you might remember. Now, having experienced a bit, particularly bad start to that season, the Aston Villa fans were not in a particularly forgiving mood when David O'Leary responded to a question relating to the fact that he was being booed by his own supporters with the assertion that the home fans were in some way fickle. Now, at the next Aston Villa home game, the fans unraveled the banner, which was to immortalise David O'Leary's unsuccessful reign at that club, that simply read, we are, not, we are not fickle, we just don't like you. <laughs> now, on an, absolute pers on an absolute personal level, it is a real honour for me to be here today as a Trinity College politics student. You can imagine McGill comes up quite regularly and we keep a close eye on it. But when I talk about political apathy, what causes it and who can solve it, you'll have to forgive me that my response is going to be not too dissimilar to the Aston Villa supporters of 2005, when I say, my generation, we are not apathetic. We just don't like you. <laughs> so um, so I'll, I will enthusiastically discuss the many causes and the possible solutions to political apathy. I, act, I absolutely reject the premise that my generation is wholly apathetic. We are, we are interest-based and we are heavily engaged, as you've already heard. As a consequence of the fact that many of yesterday's student radicals are today's political elites, we perhaps do not get age in such an obvious manner as joining a political party, but my generation and young people in general are ever present in contributing their labour free of charge in a manner entirely alien to anyone born in the years preceding the 1980s. We are the generation who rarely patent their ideas. We write, we blog, we share information on a scale that has never before been seen in human history, and we do that for free. Now, Dottie has already touched on the concept of social enterprise, which I'm also kind of a big supporter of. But my generation, we are the generation who are, again, we are, we are once again prioritizing the concept of the collective good. We volunteer on a massive scale. If I was to randomly select a two-page CV from anybody in this room below the age of 30, I absolutely guarantee you that it would be half filled with work which they undertook for free. Ladies and gentlemen, I am absolutely convinced we as a generation are not ethically, we are not socially, and we are not civically apathetic. But we have a political culture, culture in this country that is morally bankrupt, and we are uncomfortable in propping up a system that is unsuited to the purpose intended. Now, it's somewhat easy to define political apathy in the sense that it involves the disengagement from the most obvious elements of the political system, with low vote or turnout at election time being the prime manifestation of this malaise. Now, insofar as I myself am a 27-year-old elective representative of Dublin's north inner city, I could be accused of navigating the most treacherous waters of political apathy in the sense that I was elected primarily by the younger cohort of an electoral ward that rarely exceeds 40%. Now, with such low figures turning out to exercise their democratic right to vote for a representative of their choice every couple of years, it would probably be naive to argue against the notion that there exists a disgruntlement that emanates from a large population proportion of the populace to the political system in general. Now, as I can imagine, okay, I've already touched on this, but anyone else in this room who spent the first half a year canvassing door to door, asking people can vote for them, can attest to, it's not only that many are apathetic to politics, but rather that they are viscerally hostile to those who seek to engage in a system that many consider to be too tarnished beyond repair. You're all the same. Nothing ever changes, and we only ever see you at election time. These are just some examples of the type of bromides that I was met with while canvassing on the local election trail of 2014, and I'm an independent who doesn't come from a political background, so I can imagine how others must have experienced it. 
Now, presumably contained within many of these expressions of frustration are motivations behind which so many take the decision to remove themselves from the political process. And in this vein, it is not entirely difficult to ascertain one of the primary contributors to political apathy is the erosion of trust that exists between the electorate and the political classes. You ask us, what causes political apathy? And I suppose at a most fundamental level, it's, it's people like me, or it's rather it's people like what I could become should I follow the too often trudge path of reneging upon the convictions that encourage people to choose me as their representative. In knocking at people's door, in outlining a vision of how I'd like to contribute to improving the circumstances of the communities we aspire to represent, we are asking that the people, they invest a semblance of their trust and a semblance of their hoping to us as political representatives. And too often in this state have political parties and individuals abused that trust by blatantly making false promises that seek to only capture the aspiration of the day and to the detriment of the voter of tomorrow. Too often has party politics been responsive only to the ideals of the wealthy and once more to the detriment of the ideals of representative democracy. It is almost embarrassing for me to even sit here and to even mention the ideals of representative democracy when one considers the class, the gender and the cultural imbalance of our own doll Aaron. Do we even pretend to believe in a government of the people, by the people and for the people anymore? Did anybody flinch, even but an eyelash, when the last cabinet reshuffle unfolded a front bench of predominantly white, middle class, conservative men? If we believe in a semblance of representative democracy, then surely we must look around at our own Dáil Éireann and ask the question, for which people? And it's, it is an absolute matter of fact that it's communities such as my own which exhibit the highest levels of social and economic disadvantage where what many would describe as the manifestations of political apathy are so highly pronounced. Yes, absolutely, without question. Our, election, our, our turnout on election days is low, but that perhaps that correlates directly with the level of interest consecutive governments have taken in confronting the type of residual poverty and structural inequality of too long blighted the landscape of working class communities throughout Ireland. And yet the question remains as to why people, whether young or old, are politically apathy, are political apathetic, and yet the most obvious response is, is why wouldn't they be? In our victim blaming culture, we continue to lament the figures, and yet nobody seeks to address why we expect societies most marginalised to engage politically in a system that offers no real representation and actively seeks to impoverish them. A system that makes access to education unequal and expensive. A system that protects the wealth of the privileged and actively seeks to export their discontented young or to lock in their economic discomfort through activation measures that appear to exist only for the purpose of massaging the figures and for an opportunity of a press release. It was my own apathy with the political system that motivated me to contest the recent local elections. You can't change the system if you merely go around hating it, is what I told myself. But in doing so, I engaged in the most obvious way that I could think of. I ran for election. In doing so, I was very careful not to make false promises to people regarding what I could and could not achieve if successful in this election. But there is a powerlessness that comes with local government that I fear will result in both myself and those who voted for me asking the question, what's the point? The three most prominent conversations I had at the doors while canvassing for the local election pertain to the broad issue of housing, inadequate waste management services and local regeneration projects, particularly in the flat complexes where the status quo parties are rarely to be found. Now, the people who voted for me, voted for others like me, did so on the assumption that we are different from those who went before us, and hopefully we are. But still, we cannot penetrate the issues that matter to people because of the consequence of executive functions and almost zero input into budgetary spending at council level. Now, when I go back to the electorate and explain this, and many of the electorate who voted for me will have voted for the first time in their life. Will it be irrational for them to question the logic of again engaging in a system that offers no authority to the people they saw fit to elect? My own, my own big fear is that in engaging in politics, will that further exasperate the hopelessness that people in my own community feel for the political system? You know, we often talk about apathy without ever discussing the virtuous juxtaposition of that voice, empathy. 
in attempting to highlight solutions to counter the increase in toilet of apathy, we often talk about compulsory voting or weekend voting or compulsory voting with the option of the none of the above. So we, even, we can even capture political disillusionment for future analysis. But none of these are actually solutions to political apathy. They are merely actions by which we can increase voter turnout. On their own, they can do absolutely nothing to solve the problem we are here to discuss today. To penetrate even slightly the cause of apathy, we need to demonstrate the type of reactive empathy that is displayed by the thousands of members of my generation, motivated by, who, motivated by their compassion, seek to make life a little bit more bearable for those who find themselves in positions of vulnerability. I'm going to tell you about an organisation in my own community of the North Inner City, or rather, as Dr. McCullough, a, a social startup, a social enterprise that's simply called the Inner City Helping Homeless which began last winter when a couple of young ladies in a local gym discussed how awful it would be to find yourself sleeping rough on the streets during their bitingly cold as embers. Now, so much has happened since then, but essentially, twice a week, those same ladies and all the other volunteers who became the inner city helping homeless take to the streets of Dublin from 11 p.m. onwards to provide food, a hot drink, and some warm clothes to people who find them, who people who find themselves in some cases are in positions that are actually only slightly more precarious than those who are actually distributing the provisions themselves. The Lord Mayor of my city, Councillor Christy Burke, is actually the chair of the inner city helping homeless. And he goes on this homeless run weekly without fail. Several months back, Christy was leading a team of volunteers who came across a 17-year-old heavily pregnant girl attempting to sleep inside an industrial bin in Temple Bar. This is Ireland. This is 2014, and you are asking us why we are apathetic. Do you really want to solve apathy of the politically disillusioned? Is your intention merely that this girl in the industrial bin and the people who found her, many of whom themselves are experiencing a poverty that dare not speak even its own name, vote and then go back about their lives of perseverance or survival? Or should we continue to talk about political reform as if the usual dichotomy of SIP2 versus OIBEX makes a blind bit of difference to the person living on the street? to the family in direct provision centre or the mother who chooses one day out of seven to not eat and is dreading the, the imposition of the water to charges because she's simply already been pushed to the brink. You question why my generation is politically apathetic and yet the political system dare not look at its own reflection in their eyes. If you wish to address the causation of our apathy, then you must first realise that it's about more than si simply offering tax incentives or pay rises to people who we will never relate. It is bigger still than workers versus employers or the political spectrum of right versus left. We are so very tired of living in an economy where trickle-down economics means some people might be able to get jobs as cleaners in large financial institutions. If you wanted to address the cause of our apathy, then maybe we can invest in public housing, affordable childcare, domestic violence services or recovery beds where people who injected themselves with a poison in the hope of escaping the hell of what it was their everyday life can find the services they need to become clean again. Could I conclude with a request? That request being that politics and politicians, of which I must of course now include myself, can we please come down from our ivory towers and perhaps for the first time in a long time re-engage in what is actually occurring in the agora of Irish society? Could you please stop being apathetic towards not only my generation, but my community and other communities similar to mine, and in particular to the multitude of different volunteers, interest groups and organisations who have to step in to fill the cracks of society from which, you have, from which you have long since relinquished responsibility. We live in a society where 80,000 people rest uncomfortably on the waiting list for social housing, where women are denied their reproductive rights, where even today, despite all that we have apologised for, we still institutionalise marginalised groups and access to hospitals for the sick, the elderly and the disabled is determined by one's ability to part with the appropriate amounts of cash. I can point you to a thousand examples of where my generation has willfully taken the baton from those who have campaigned before us and we have demanded progressive action on all these issues and more. Now you look me in the eye and you tell me, who's the generation that is apathetic? Thanks. Thank you.